Hi, today we're going to be going over ATP and coupled reactions. And if you find this video to be of help, please do subscribe to my channel, and that will help other people find this video as well. Now, before we talk about ATP and coupled reactions, we have to understand what exergonic and endergonic reactions are. I'll summarize that quickly here, but do use the link above for a more thorough explanation to refresh your memory or to work through some practice questions. Extragonic reactions give off free energy, so they have a negative delta G. A way to look at it is like this, that the reactants are going to react with each other to form products, and energy is going to be released in the process. Now, that free energy can be used to do work. Now, as a reminder, remember that the change in free energy, the delta G is negative because there are there's more free energy in the reactants than in the product. So a negative delta G indicates that energy is given off. And that's why this is a type of exergonic reaction. Now, on the other hand, endergonic reactions require energy in order to proceed. So the reactants will not react with each other unless there's an input of energy into the reaction. And then they will react with each other to form products. So because endergonic reactions require energy, their change in free energy, delta G, is positive. Positive delta G means that there are more, there's more energy in the products than there is in the reactants. So endergonic reactions require energy, okay? Where does the energy come from in the cell? Do you have any ideas about maybe just from what we've discussed where endergonic reactions might obtain some free energy from? Right, so all endergonic reactions in living things are made possible by coupling them together with an exergonic reaction. So we know that the exergonic reaction gives off free energy so that free energy can be used to fuel the endergonic reaction. And we call these coupled reactions because of that. Because couple, you know, if you have a couple, that's two things. Well, what coupled reactions means is that an endergonic reaction, in order to happen, is going to happen pretty much at the same time as an exergonic reaction. The exergonic reaction is going to release free energy that gets transferred to the endergonic reaction so that those reactants in the endergonic reaction can proceed to form products. So here's another way to look at coupled reactions. Over here, right on our y-axis, we see free energy. So low free energy at the bottom and higher free energy at the top. Now we have two different types of reactions going on here. On the left is an exergonic reaction, and on the right is an endergonic reaction. Now we know that exergonic reactions are going to give off free energy. Endergonic reactions, as we see here, those reactants are going to need some free energy so that they can react with each other to form products. So this exergonic and endergonic reaction are coupled together, right? They happen at the same, about the same time because those exergonic reactions going to generate the free energy used to fuel the endergonic reaction. So here's a way to look at this, right? The exergonic reaction, we have the reactants and they have a lot of free energy so this is going to be a spontaneous reaction. Those reactants react with each other to form products that have lower free energy because free energy is released in the process of that exergonic reaction. Now in a coupled reaction, that free energy from the endergonic reaction is gonna be transferred to the reactants of the endergonic reaction. And now that the reactants are energized, they have enough free energy to react with each other to form the products. Okay, so we call these coupled reactions because they happen together. For every endergonic reaction that needs free energy, we're going to need an extragonic reaction that releases free energy that can be transferred to that endergonic reaction. And all endergonic reactions of living organisms are made possible by coupling reactions in this way. Now, in living things, ATP is the primary coupling agent. Okay, coupling agent just means that this is the substance that's going to be involved in the exergonic reaction and provide the energy for the endergonic reaction. ATP, this is the molecule that's going to go through that endergonic reaction and release free energy to fuel that endergonic reaction. Now remember, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Maybe say that out loud a couple of times adenosine triphosphate. See, it's not that bad. Adenosine triphosphate. Right. And let me show you, this is a drawing I made of this molecule called ATP, adenosine triphosphate. 
And the reason we call it adenosine triphosphate is because of what this molecule is composed of. So on this side, in circles, the circles represent three phosphate groups that are bonded together. That's the triphosphate part of ATP. Now, attached to those three phosphate groups is a sugar, and that's this blue pentagon here, uh, illustrated by this blue pentagon. The sugar in this case is known as ribose. And then attached on the other side of the sugar is a nitrogenous base known as adenine. Okay, so adenine and the sugar together are known as adenosine. And that's why this molecule is called adenosine triphosphate. So does this molecule, this structure, look familiar to you at all? So maybe you thought DNA. DNA actually uses molecules like this, structures like this that are called nucleotides. So this is like uh, A, C, C, and G that we find in DNA. But actually, because the sugar here is ribose and not deoxyribose, this ATP is the nucleotide that's found in RNA, okay, not DNA. If the sugar was deoxyribose, then this would exactly be the nucleotide that we find in DNA. Okay, so ATP, not only is it part of RNA, it's one of the nucleotides of RNA, it's also an important molecule that goes through exergonic reactions to release free energy for those endergonic reactions. Now that we've gone over the general shape and structure of ATP, I want to go into a little bit more detail about the different components of this molecule. Now, here are those three phosphate groups, as promised. A phosphate group is simply what's found in this circle. Okay, it's a phosphorus atom that shares a single bond with three oxygen atoms, and it shares a double bond with one oxygen atom. So in adenosine triphosphate, in ATP, we have three phosphate groups that are bonded together. In the case of ATP, energy is stored in these three phosphate groups. And the reason is because each one of them is very negatively charged. So there's actually a lot of potential energy in the bonds that are keeping these phosphate groups bonded together, these three together. So it's kind of like magnets, you know. If you've ever taken magnets and taken like two of the negative sides and tried to push them together, they're not attracted to each other. You actually have to put some energy into that to get those two negative sides close to each other. And it's the same thing here with these phosphate groups because they're negatively charged. So there's a lot of potential energy stored in the bonds of these phosphate groups. Now we also see that the three phosphate groups are attached to the sugar, which is ribose. And then ribose is attached to the nitrogenous, nitrogenous base adenine. So I want to give you an example of how ATP energizes these endergonic reactions. But first, we need to break down the difference between adenosine triphosphate, diphosphate, and monophosphate. You know that this molecule called ATP is called adenosine triphosphate because there are three phosphate groups bonded together as part of it. So this is ATP. Now, those phosphate groups are going to be transferred to the reactants of the endergonic reaction. So ATP is going to lose one of its phosphate groups. When ATP loses one of its phosphate groups, well, now it's known as ADP, adenosine diphosphate, because there's only two, di means two. So when there are two phosphate groups, it's adenosine diphosphate. Now, actually, one of these phosphate groups can still be transferred to another reactant to provide energy for that reactant. And in that case, if ADP transfers one of its phosphate groups to another reactant, then ADP is now going to be AMP, adenosine monophosphate. Now, this is the maximum number of phosphates that ATP or ADP can donate, okay, one at a time. But once we get down to AMP, well, now the molecule has to be recharged, okay, and the cells will need to add those phosphate groups back um, onto AMP to form ADP and then another phosphate group to form ATP, okay? So adenosine triphosphate loses a phosphate group to, to become adenosine diphosphate, ADP, and then ADP loses a phosphate group to become AMP, adenosine monophosphate. Now here's that example of the coupled reaction again, right? The extragonic reaction goes through the reaction to produce products and free energy is released. That free energy from the exergonic reaction is going to be transferred to the reactants of the endergonic reaction. And now those reactants can react with each other because the endergonic reaction needed free energy in order to proceed. And they've received it from the exergonic reaction. 
So now energize, that endergonic reaction can now proceed to form products. This is where ATP comes into it. So ATP goes through the exergonic reaction to become ADP. Now, what's missing, what's given off as free energy is that phosphate group. Instead of drawing out all the phosphorus and oxygen atoms, you'll often see that phosphate group abbreviated as P with a subscript I, okay? P for phosphate group and I means inorganic, okay? So this is inorganic, meaning there's no carbon in this molecule. This is inorganic phosphate. But really what it means is one of those phosphate groups from ATP. So ATP goes through the exergonic reaction, releases a phosphate group, and that's the energy that gets provided to the reactants of the endergonic reaction. Now that the energy is there, that phosphate group is there, those reactants can react with each other to form products. Okay, so this is why ATP is so important in our cells because all endergonic reactions of living organisms are made possible by coupling reactions in this way. And ATP, by going through this exergonic reaction and being hydrolyzed, it releases that phosphate group, which acts as free energy for the reactants of the endergonic reaction. Let me give you an example in more detail of how ATP works. Okay, so here's something that happens in living organisms. Glutamic acid is an amino acid, and glutamic acid can react with ammonia to form glutamine, which is another amino acid. Okay, so we have lots of different reactions, metabolic reactions that take place in the cell to make different substances that we need, like the 20 amino acids that we have. So glutamic acid can react with ammonia to form the other amino acid, glutamine. Now, the delta G for this reaction is positive 3.4 kilocalories per mole. You don't have to know anything about the number here, but what we have to know is that the delta G is positive. A positive delta G means that energy needs to be put into the reaction before glutamic acid and ammonia can react to form glutamine. So with a positive change in free energy, a positive delta G, that means that energy needs to be put into the reaction. That means that this is a endergonic reaction. So ATP can help out in such a case, right? By going through an exergonic reaction first. So this is how ATP is involved in glutamic acid and ammonia forming glutamine. The first step is that glutamic acid is going to react with ATP. This is the exergonic reaction. And so ATP is going to be broken down or hydrolyzed to ADP, and that phosphate group gets transferred to glutamic acid. When a phosphate group is added onto a molecule, we call that molecule phosphorylated, okay? And the process is known as phosphorylation, okay? So let's say that, okay? Phosphorylation. Phosphorylation is the process of adding a phosphate group bonding a phosphate group onto a molecule. So glutamic acid here was phosphorylated. So ATP is broken down into ADP, and meanwhile, glutamic acid becomes phosphorylated. So now it has the energy to proceed through the reaction. So now the glutamic acid is phosphorylated. It now has the free energy to react with ammonia to form glutamine. And this is how glutamine, our amino acid, is formed from glutamic acid and ammonia. And you can see how ATP is important in this process, okay? So to make glutamine in the cell, a coupled reaction occurs with ATP. ATP is hydrolyzed, it's broken down, and the phosphate group is covalently bound to glutamic acid. And we call this often an intermediate because now this glutamic acid can react with ammonia to form glutamine. So the phosphorylation of glutamic acid increases its free energy, meaning it's more reactive and now this reaction can proceed. Okay, so you see how ATP was involved in this. ATP was broken down so that phosphate group could be used to phosphorylate one of the reactants in the endergonic reaction. That phosphorylation now provides the energy so the glutamic acid can react with pneumonia and form glutamine. And by the way, in the process of forming glutamine, that phosphate group is released. 
So the phosphate group doesn't become part of glutamine. It actually provided that free energy so that glut glutamic acid and ammonia could react with each other. So whenever these endergonic reactions have to happen in living things, ATP will be there to go through a coupled reaction, right? It goes through that reaction with one of the substrates to energize the substrate so that now that substrate has enough free energy to proceed to form products in that originally endergonic reaction. See how that works? Now, I know you're wondering, how does ATP get recharged in the cell? We have ATP, and when one of the phosphate groups is transferred to another molecule, then it's ADP. And ADP can have a phosphate group removed to phosphorylate another molecule. And we're down to AMP. So at that point, there's no more phosphate groups to energize other substrates within the cell. So how does ATP get recharged? How do we get from AMP back to ATP? And the answer is a very important series of reactions in cells known as cellular respiration. So I know if you're studying cellular respiration, it's like, oh my gosh, all these different reactions going on. It's so hard to keep track and all this stuff is involved. And that's true. But take a step back and say, what is the point of cellular respiration? Well, the point of cellular respiration is that glucose is used along with oxygen in the process to form ATP. Now, if we have AMP, it gets charged back to ADP. And then that a ADP gets charged back to ATP. Okay, so cellular respiration's whole point is to recharge the ATP in the cell. The food that we eat, and we use glucose here, which is a sugar, because it goes through most all of the pathways, so we can follow the process of cellular respiration from beginning to end. But any of the food that we eat can be broken down and used in the reactions of cellular respiration. And at the end of cellular respiration, phosphate groups get added back onto AMP or ADP, and that's how we recharge ATP so that our cells can use ATP to energize other reactions that need energy within the cell. So the whole point of cellular respiration is to recharge the ATP. So let's recap what we learned today about ATP and coupled reactions. First, we need to know that exergonic reactions give off free energy, while endergonic reactions require energy in order to proceed. Now, all endergonic reactions in living things are made possible by coupling them together with an exergonic reaction, right? The exergonic reaction gives off free energy, and that free energy is used to fuel the endergonic reaction. And because these reactions happen together, we call them coupled reactions. So in cells, it's ATP that's going to participate in that reaction that results in one of its phosphate groups being transferred to one of the reactants. So one of the reactants will become phosphorylated. And once the reactant is phosphorylated, the endergonic reaction now has enough free energy in the reactants to proceed, and the products will be formed. So take five minutes now on your own. See if you can walk through this process and summarize, either with bullet points or by drawing it out, the process of these coupled reactions, what exergonic and endergonic reactions have to do with it, and how ATP is imperative for this to occur.